Let's pray for inspiration. Holy Spirit, you fill our hearts. Kindle in them the fire of your love and fill our minds with the light of your wisdom. Amen. Well, last Sunday, I started sharing a vision of our church in the years ahead. It's a vision I believe that God has been showing our church council and me. And at the heart of this vision is today's gospel scene. Today's gospel scene, Jesus affirms the basics of an expansive, full, spiritual life. Basics are to love God, love our neighbor, love ourselves. And he tells the lawyer in this scene, if you do this, love God, love neighbor, love self, you will live. You will live. It's that simple. Now, you notice that he reframes the lawyer's question, what must I do to have eternal life? which sounds kind of like life after we die. And he turns it into a statement about God's purpose for our life right now, here and now. The purpose is to love God, love neighbor, love self. And we will live today, right now, every day. And that is what is at the heart of the vision for our church, this vision of loving God, neighbor, and self. Last week, I described our calling as a church to be dream catchers, to be dream catchers, to be the keepers and proclaimers and interpreters of God's dream for the world, a world which has become increasingly disillusioned with cultural Christianity, with its judgmentalism and exclusivity, and fear-based kind of teaching. And we are called to keep alive God's dream of radical welcome, radical love, radical inclusivity, radical joy. That's the gospel. That's the good news. And we will love God We will love God by loving God's dream and by seeking the way of God to that dream, which is the way of Jesus. And we will love ourselves by learning about and practicing this life-giving way of Jesus and letting ourselves be nourished by the sacred dream book, the Bible, and nourished by prayer, and nourished by community. That's how we'll love ourselves. Today, I want to focus on how we can love our neighbor. I want to paint a picture of how our church can do that in the years ahead. And this picture is inspired by a man named Peter Lowenheim who is determined to cross the invisible lines that kept neighbors apart in his neighborhood. He got it in his head to do this when a horrible tragedy happened just down his street. One night, uh, a man uh, shot and killed his wife and himself. And the couple's two middle school children ran out screaming into the night. And this family had lived in the neighborhood for seven years, and Peter Lowenheim did not know them at all. None of the other neighbors knew them at all. And so this horrible tragedy didn't seem to have much effect on the neighborhood. And how can it be, Lowenheim started asking himself, how can it be that neighbors can live right next to each other and not know each other, not know how to help each other? How can it be in a world where we have cheap, long-distance rates, we can fly coast to coast, we have the internet, we can connect with people all over the world? How can it be that we would be strangers to the people next door to us? Well, Lohenheim wondered what it would take to penetrate these invisible barriers, and he came up with an idea. 
he would stay over at his neighbor's houses, stay the night, take his backpack, stay there, and he would write about their lives. That was his idea. So he started calling his neighbors, emailing his neighbors, knocking on his neighbor's doors. The first neighbor turned him down. <laughs> would you? <laughs> Thought, hmm, who is this guy? Now, by the way, Peter Lowenheim's teenage children were so embarrassed by all this. <laughs> but he, he persisted. The second person he approached, a neighbor named Lou, who was 81 years old, retired physician, told him, well, you can write about my life if you want, but it'll be boring. But when Lowenheim stayed over at Lou's house, he found that Lou was not boring. Lou told him that he had just lost his wife of 52 years. And Lou said, you know, people say that's how wonderful that you had 52 years together. And Lou said, I, I always say, well, I was just getting to know her. <laughs> Lou shared stories about his grandparents immigrating, immigrating from Italy. He shared stories about applying to medical school when there was an anti-Italian quota. He shared stories about building his career and raising his family, and Peter Lowenheim really got to know Lou, and they became good friends. They went to the gym together. They spent time together. And this happened with other people in the neighborhood. Lowenheim also spent the night at the home of a, of a young couple, both in business, uh, spent the night at uh, the home of a real estate agent with two small children, at the home of a pathologist married to a pediatrician specializing in autism, a lot of do doctors in that neighborhood. <laughs> and he really got to know people. He really got to know people just by s hanging out with them. And he wanted to go beyond just getting to know them into being part of a community of care. And so when someone in the neighborhood got sick with breast cancer, someone that people really didn't know, Peter Lowenheim got together with his neighbors and arranged to give her rides to the doctor, arranged to take care of the children. Community was formed. Love your neighbor as yourself. That is part of the way of Jesus. Love your neighbor as yourself. And it's God's vision for us as a church. And our neighbors are not just people on College Avenue. Our neighbors really are all the people of greater Modesto, I think. And God envisions us crossing the invisible line, lines that keep even us as a church kind of more to ourselves and our, and our sanctuary and our fortress. I think sometimes we tend to do that. We tend to stay to ourselves as a church, maybe because, I don't know, maybe we are afraid of being rejected as an open and affirming church. Or, or maybe, maybe it's because those of us who see ourselves as liberal are afraid to, to mix church and state, make religion should be private, right? But God is asking us to step out of our comfort zone and to trust. God is not asking us to convert our neighbors. <laughs> God is asking us to love our neighbors, and we can't do that unless we know our neighbors, and they know us as a church. Now, we've taken some steps in that direction, right? We've gotten to know uh, some of our neighbors who operate the Family Promise Program, and then through those, we've worked with those neighbors to get to know some of our neighbors who are homeless, and they've had some stayovers here at our house, in our fellowship hall. Maybe there could be more stayovers if more of us get involved in the Family Promise Program. We've gotten to know some of our neighbors who need food and clothing here in Modesto by operating the uh, uh, food pantry and clothes closet at IFM one Saturday a month. Maybe we could turn that into two Saturdays a month. There's a need. 
we have gotten to know students at Modesto High School, those of us who are mentors at Modesto High School. And we sponsor a program called The Place for LGBT teens that are countywide. They come here twice a month. Well, we might get to know those neighbors better by being speakers in the program, by being chaperones at, at their dances, and we do that. We could do it more, maybe. And we've started to get to know our neighbors right across the street. I have to make sure which way I am. Right across the street at Roosevelt Junior High. The first day of school, we passed out cookies and Rice Krispie treats to 60 students who crossed our campus every day. What if we continued building our relationships with those students? And what if we find out what, what they need, how we could help them? Maybe they need an after-school safe place in our youth building with some adult mentors and refreshments and music. Maybe they need tutoring. Maybe we could get to know some of our neighbors who are teachers over at Roosevelt to, to see more what the needs are. And our council has envisioned other ways that we might be good neighbors. What if we had a counseling program for families who are homeless or for LGBT families with their specific particular issues and marriage counseling for such people and maybe divorce counseling for such people now. Some unique needs. Maybe our neighbors could use a class on managing depression, aging. It's possible. Maybe in schools, students need some help in confronting bullying or suicide prevention. Maybe we could become better neighbors with other people in the community to partner with them to, to work with students, to help students with those needs. Maybe, well, I think maybe we should just be curious, right? Be curious about who our neighbors are. Who are they? Be curious about what we might be able to do. I think that's God's vision for us so that we can serve. Get to know our neighbors. Maybe one way to get to know our neighbors would be to throw a Valentine's dance, a community Valentine's dance for every kind of couple and every kind of single. Or throw a block party. Or have a cookout for MJC students. Or we could have a, a walk for cancer that starts maybe on our own labyrinth. This is a vision of constantly trying new things. Just trying new things, trying new, and not being afraid to fail. So if we have a Valentine's dance and nobody comes to our Valentine's dance, well, then we listen some more and come up with three or four or five or six or seven other ways to engage our neighbors. If next Saturday at the blessing of the pets in the dog park at noon, <laughs> If people don't come, we passed out some flyers at the dog park. Well, maybe we have to have a blessing of the pets at a pet groomer's shop. Who knows? We just keep trying, right? We have to trust that God is asking us to be a blessing to our world. As, as Ray was saying today with our young people, Abram and Sarah called to take a journey, this journey of faith, journey of growth, journey of trust, ultimately to be a blessing to the world. That's what God says to Abraham. Bless all the peoples of the earth with your life, your community, your faith. We're called to be line crossers. Now, Something that was left out of today's reading is the long story, the parable of the Good Samaritan. We talked about that a couple weeks ago, you know, because Jesus is talking to the lawyer about loving your neighbor, and the lawyer says, well, who is my neighbor? And Jesus turns it around and says, how do you be a neighbor? And his response is, you be a neighbor by stepping out of your comfort zone, someone you don't even know on the road there to help. You cross that invisible line. Cross the line. You might know the game, crossing the line. I think it used to be played at the Day of Respect. It 
schools in Modesto. And it's played like this. A leader asks students questions like, have you ever been hurt by someone that you love? Or have you ever wanted to make a difference in the world? Have you ever wanted to be understood better or to understand somebody else better? And as students say yes to these questions, they all step on the same side of a line painted on the floor and learn that they are neighbors, that they can get to know and love one another. And that's God's vision for us, to be line crossers, not to be afraid. I'll confess something to you. This isn't in my sermon today, if you have a copy of it. <laughs> it's difficult for me to do that. I went to the dog park yesterday with flyers, and my heart was beating 100 miles an hour. And all I was doing is giving people flyers, saying, you want your dog blessed? And I was so encouraged, because people seemed delighted, that I started stopping people walking their dogs on the street. <laughs> I said, do you, would you like to have your dog blessed? <laughs> oh, of course. Cool. And in the action itself, I find energy and courage, and it clicks in my head, oh, this is what it means to cross the invisible line. This is what it means. That's, that's a great feeling. So I think, I think that's a vision that God has for us as a church so many of you are already wonderful line crossers. Bold, and courageous, outgoing, loving. And we take that wonderful energy of being neighbors into the world and, and we love the world. It's a vision of what we're called to do. This is vision part two. Amen. Amen. <laughs>